Welcome to Chatterbooks, episode 6. Chatterbooks is here to introduce you to independent British authors and books, to help you find the real gems in the huge amount of small press and self-published books that are available. This episode, I'm pleased to read you a complete story from Deliverance Machine and Other Stories by Oliver M. Cox. Here's the blurb from the back of the book. A collection of short stories on dying, disorder and distress, set in the present and barely distant future. A study on creation and destruction, self-destruction and self-preservation, and how we can never quite seem to find the right instinct for the case in hand. This is A Tie Means Life. This meeting of the moral executive decrees that an individual should not have ultimate control over the cessation or continuation of their life, in light of the manifold and far-reaching effects of the death of an individual upon their kin. The minutes of the 17th Congress of the Moral Executive, 21st of September, 2022. In the idle corridors of my imagination, I've pictured my life during and after some serious fuck-up, hurt or suffering. I watched TV and thought about what it would be like if I was one of those skeletons in Somalia or if I lost a limb. One has to reach an accord in tough moments to take the humiliation or pain that the day has served and continue on. We all have our ways of dealing with it. Some call on God, others are just hard. Once, I was riding on the back of a motorcycle with a girl I loved, wearing no helmet while meandering through the traffic. I wanted to get off the motorcycle, but I loved her. I fear I'd die, and to comfort myself, I embraced the meaninglessness of existence. And it worked. These lazy facets of my imagination pale in comparison to complete paralysis. I can't move. In my imagination... I've explored getting on without a limb, or walking the streets with one eye, and it didn't prepare me for needing someone to take a shit for me. I communicate by moving my left eye. Paralysed people are usually nice, aren't they? Before I lost control over my body, I was a drug dealer. Somewhere between the alley skulkers who do you skunk, and the gents with handkerchiefs in their pockets, who will invite you to their place for cocaine. All one needed to do was make a call, and I'd come over, with acid or speed. The dealing ended, but I kept the veil of misfits and sots and my whore of a girlfriend. My people were accepting. Danny Dan used to drop round with a couple of tabs, and we'd trip, and though it didn't always cheer me up, it never completely failed. Jenny used to put on German porn videos and grind, wait for my erection and straddle the chair. Nevertheless, I wanted to die. I wanted to die when I could control my body. I would have felt claustrophobic without the possibility of ending it all. Now I can't move. I want that possibility. But the condition which spurs the decision denies me the option. I'll need help to die. Now this is the start of the complications. In order to get help dying, I need permission. And to get permission to die, I need to appeal to the health ombudsman will consider my case. It gets even more fucked up from there. Jenny wheeled me into a hall. I couldn't get the name of the architecture. The ombudsman sat at the other end in a cloak and wig on a raised platform. A clerk loafed onto the cushy carpet and spoke my name. The ombudsman, a disgustingly obese man with a floppy bottom lip, looked at me and said, "'You wish to have the state's permission to die?' I waited. His empty eyes were stationary, fixated on me, whilst his bottom lick hung like a suspended slug. I realised he wasn't satisfied with the official declaration that my solicitor had sorted out. He wanted me to talk. With a jerk of my eye, I fired up the speech synthesiser and selected Y. The speaker emitted a Y8 sound. That shit pile up front didn't deserve any more than a single letter. He fondled his front teeth with his tongue before he spoke. I declare that the Assisted Suicide Committee should select and assemble a focus group of the claimant's kin. This group will meet and deliberate in one week. The committee, 
Choose 20 people you know and who you'll hurt if you have yourself killed. They put them in a room with instant coffee and cheap biscuits and get them to chat about whether you should die. Then they vote on it. A simple majority in either direction carries the day, while a tie means life. The state tells us what to do because it can, and when you can't move, it claims power over death. It's illegal to kill yourself, whatever the state of your body, but there's not much they can do after you've put a six-shooter in your mouth and fired, is there? They'll put you in prison if you manage to fuck that up, though. Jenny, not bothering with anything more than a jumper and knickers, showed in a woman, face red and puffy, her jaw almost in spasm. My mother. She clutched a crumpled piece of paper, her summons to the suicide focus group. Bumping onto her knees in front of me, she massaged my calves and wailed, Why do you want to leave us? People with locked-in syndrome were highly indifferent. I couldn't touch her or press my lips together in sympathy. I activated the speech synthesizer, and as she got up and swept the stuff from the mantelpiece onto the floor, a couple of bongs, an ornamental plate, a picture of her, some other crap, I, apostrophe, M, space, S, O, R, R, I don't want you to go, Y, I'm sorry. A couple of years ago, a bunch of moralists decided that whether someone can get assistance to die should be determined by the people who are close to them. These guys decided that an individual is not an island and that we affect people through our actions. And suicide, emotionally and economically, should be a decision made by those who are affected by it, just as how the government should rule with the assent of the governed. They were having their laugh with the whole government idea, they weren't they? They're discussing me now. My parents, grandparents friends, Jenny, and nearly forgotten contacts. They'll decide. It's up to them. I'll be chuffed if they think that a leech like me deserves a legal injunction to be kept alive. But they also know that I want to die, so they'll be against me if they vote that way. They don't use the phone to deliver the message. They send over some poor fucker with the worst job in the world, who has to pop a letter in the claimant's hand that says whether he has permission to terminate his life. Do these guys go for drinks after work? You should have seen this guy, totally bloody paralysed. Yeah, good buddy, you see him all in this job. I'm in my front room, parked in front of the television. They set it up so I can flick my eye to change channels, hopping through to maximise my intake of cruelty and sex. They sent a nurse to look after me whilst Jenny wasn't there. He skulked in the kitchen probably didn't like the television I was watching. As the bad guys, whom, personally, I liked, were pummeled, the action film ended. I jerked my eye to select another channel, but there was no response. The fucking thing had broken. I wasn't too phased, though. The nurse checked periodically, but it was a shame that I'd have to watch the science documentary which followed the film. It was about the sun. I watched as billions of years from now, the sun blokes into a red giant spilling out its envelope and consuming Mercury, Venus, and after desiccating its surface, Earth. The nurse shuffled in and cocked his head, replacing a cable which had come loose and restoring my channel-changing and speaking capabilities. The doorbell sounded, and he slumped towards the entrance. He returned, holding a cream envelope with the stupid heart-shaped seal of the moral executive. At my order, he opened it, and held the letter in front of my face. Dear William Thompson. The Kin Committee, after deliberation and voting, has granted you the right to contract assistance for the termination of your life. You may now solicit help from the licensed suicide vendors. For the first time in my life, the people who had letters sent to people were on my side. I could have done with this advantage earlier, but I needed it more at that moment than ever. So I went back to watch my action shows for a bit, before I asked my nurse to read the assisted dying section of Yellow Pages to me. If you want to read more of these great stories, then go to http colon slash slash www.john-d-scotcher.co.uk forward slash chatterbooks. There you'll find details of how to find the book. Next time, 
I'll be reading from Talk of Moonlight by Linda Acasta. I'll see you then. <laughs>